This is Andrew Paul Cronin, and you're listening to the Q&A with APC, the show that features conversations with artists, cultural figures, policymakers, performers, and other innovators living in Virginia. Episode 6, Jesse Scacia. At 36 years old, my guest Jesse Scacia has experienced more than most of us experience in a lifetime. Jesse has done so much, in fact, that my conversation with him will be released in two parts. In part one, Jesse and I will discuss Norfolk's new NEON district, which stands for New Energy of Norfolk. It's Norfolk's first official arts district, and it opens with a two-night festival called the Neon Festival, of which Jesse is co-founder. Jesse Scacia is perhaps best known as the editor-in-chief of the online publication Alt Daily. This episode begins with a discussion about the New York Knicks and their superstar Carmelo Anthony, who criticized his team for drafting a player from Latvia in the first round of the 2015 NBA Draft. This episode of the Q&A with APC was recorded Wednesday, October 7th at Jesse's apartment in downtown Norfolk. I saw your Instagram post man, I love that post about too much ale and you, you dressed up in the whole, basically the whole Knicks uniform. <laughs> and as someone who, uh, I'm a Wizards fan and I do have quite a few jerseys that I wear like when they're, when they're on TV. And I did think about, do you think he would like it if I wore my Wizards jersey <laughs> and we could just kind of like have the interview in our jerseys? Because it's like a champion uh-huh. Calbert Chaney jersey. But I didn't do that. So maybe, <laughs> maybe next time. I think probably Carmelo will come around i mean as far as carmelo's attitude towards zinger yes well i I think he has to i i think he is at a point where hopefully he's matured where he realizes he has a legacy that um and leadership is going to be part of that and attitude is part of that but i i kind of think carmelo's an asshole i'm you got to love his game you do you can't be a fan of the knicks and watch him play and not love him but in terms of him uh the way he came and the trade package that that had to get sent out him not taking less than the max. I mean, it, it will really would have made a big difference to have an extra $10 million. And when, you, when you're making $125 million, like what is happening in your life? What is the quality of life difference between $115 million and $125? It's just, you're just kind of an asshole. Right. Like uh, you can only talk about winning with a straight face so much as being your priority. Do you think Phil feels that way, Phil Jackson? About Carmelo? Probably, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about Phil Jackson? I like Phil. Yeah. He's a sort of on the Buddhist Zen tip a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for sure. Are you Giants or Jets? Uh, I've, I grew up liking the Giants. I've stopped following all sports except for the Knicks, which I just can't quit. Why have you stopped following sports other than the Knicks? Well, it, it all went downhill. From, I was in every day watching Sports Center, probably twice a day, kind of kind of dude up until um, grad school. And then I interned at ESPN in their research department at the uh, headquarters in Bristol. Mm -hmm. And I realized how much of it was totally soulless and emotionless and and about numbers. And um, and just how fantasy sports is, is really cool in the way that it lets you connect with your friends that you might not see as often. But Otherwise, it's, it's really detached from anything of any meaning. You know, sports are great in the way that they build these hero narratives and they allow for underdog narratives and they allow for, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's the human spirit actualized in flesh and sweat. But when you take that out of it, when you, when you take the storylines, it's, it's pretty asinine. And it, it's, it's a pretty, um, you know, I, I don't have a ton of confidence that I get to live a second life. So I want to be a little bit more conscious of how I spend that time and energy. So I kind of gave up the other sports, but I, I, I couldn't stop loving the Knicks if I tried. It's just, but, but there is something wonderful about sports. And, you know, that's why when this region pushes for a major league team, there's part of me that is like, okay, obviously we're being suckered again <laughs> to be played as, um, as the Rube to, 
to get a better deal from whatever city they really want to be in. But the way that sports unify a city is really special. If you've ever have you ever been in a city when they won a championship? No, coming from the DC area. Well, that's not true. So in the in the late '80s, '87, '91, uh, the the Redskins won the Super Bowl. But mm-hmm. I was, and I certainly watched those games. But I wasn't. I think it, the championship matters more when you're of drinking age it seems to me a little bit <laughs> yeah. you know like it's a different kind of celebration so since i've been able to drink um no no dc <laughs> none of my teams have won if one of your teams makes a finals mm-hmm. you get to that city just to be a part of it i think i would do the parade the night of is 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 really i mean i'm sure the parade is awesome too so what are you speaking because i mean have you the giants or were you were you a, a giants fan when they somehow won those super bowls with Eli Manning? I was actually in, in Boston for a couple of their Patriot championships, and I'm not a Patriots fan. But it's almost like if you've been to a really groovy, like if you've been to like a yoga festival or just one of these, like a fish show. Are you in a fish at all? No, but um, I, I, know the, I, can, I know the pull. I don't really like fish's music at all, but I will go to any fish show that I am near just because strangers smile at you. Do You know, there's a real same team kind of attitude with – the people around you, a real feeling of community that things like fish and things like sports teams and championships really bring out that, um, you know, it would be awesome if we could rally that way around education and, and health care and, and things of, of greater importance. But it's nice to have that feeling of I'm going to smile at this stranger and they're going to smile back. It's interesting that you apply it to politics. My wife says that one of the reasons why it's hard for Americans to come to a consensus on anything like education or health care, it's just because it's just too damn big. The country's so big. Whereas for like sports teams, it's basically like, you know, your state or your city and there's more of a thing. But well, just- we, we indoctrinate um, children into the cultures and the history of our sports and sports teams in a way that we don't in, say, um, policy discussions. Sure. Do you know? Yes. <laughs> if I, if every time I had a catch with my dad had been replaced with him talking about the different you know forms of government <laughs> you know and, and right. spread that across every father and son and um, we'd have a very different country we I mean it, it's our communal conversation and it doesn't have to be sports your middle name's Moses is that true no that that was I took that as my confirmation name okay but that was mainly to be a bastard um, because you know I think you're supposed to pick a saint so I consciously picked something from the Old Testament that was more related to uh, Judaism. So I went with Moses. Okay. I, I don't know. I came across that as your middle name, and I was thinking um, that's setting the bar pretty high for a, a young man to be <laughs> saddled with that middle name. So I guess I'm... What is, what is your middle name? I don't have one. You don't have one? No. Oh, that's kind of unique, isn't it? I, I mean, I would call it lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wasn't there any relative or author or anything they wanted to give a shout out to? Oh, you mean like on your uh, okay. as far as my parents? Can you you could probably choose one legally. I suppose so. That's probably a lot of paperwork and time. <laughs> my my biggest name challenge now is I would love to switch to the proper Italian pronunciation, but I think it would just be so freaking pretentious. What do you mean? To, well, we say Scacia, but really it should be Scotia. Ah, yeah, that would, right. But how, I mean, how do you, you, every time you correct someone, you sound like a jerk. Yeah, that's true. The Neon Festival and the Arts District, when was the first, uh, you've traveled all over, um, and you've been to different cities in in Europe and in America, and you've certainly seen different cities, uh, art districts. So when was the first sort of idea to bring one to, to Norfolk? Hannah, my, Hannah Serrano, my partner at Alt Daily for years, who now works at O'Connor, she and I had launched, along with the Downtown Norfolk Council and Grow Interactive and a group called Revision Norfolk, something called Art Everywhere, um, four or five years ago. and um, Down on Granby yes. Street. Yes, and so the spark of that was um, I only had a bike my first five years here, so it really gives you a different, slower street eye view. And things have changed so much in positive ways, but back then there were so many empty storefronts on Granby Street. So... Art is a solution in, in many ways for, for an array of problems. And in this case, it was just it looked depressing. Do you know when you would see these empty storefronts? It felt like a city in decline. And I didn't feel like we were ever going to hit that upswing without 
more vibrancy and giving people who are coming to Norfolk, considering moving a business here or starting that one here, giving them that feeling of energy and that things are happening and that people care. So it was to beautify and to inspire, but also it's sort of an economic development and, and, and tool in that way. The art everywhere was, was a success and you sort of, did you feel like after that there was an opportunity and something like this could have legs in the area and, and, and sort of go somewhere? No, I mean, important relationships were, were built there and, and we knew that we could do something on that scale and not embarrass ourselves and sort of make people proud. But it, and it was kind of a, dis, a different kind of project. There was 20 projects in between and then the art sister came back around when I ran for city council is really when that came more to the forefront and became something that I, was part of my platform. And then when I lost became the thing that I, I wanted to really continue with. Do you think you're actually able to do more in losing that city council election than you would have been able to do if you won? No, no. I mean, the, the city deals with with giant budgets and with um, really serious zoning issues. And, and the, the way that you can be a visionary on the city level is just far surpasses anything private, anything anyone private can do, unless you're very wealthy. So I don't know. It, it's sort of a nice notion. And I, I like the mindset of we don't need the stinking government like any change we want to enact in our society, be it arts districts, schools, or most anything we can probably do as a community as long as the government gets out of the way. But the people who are sitting in those chairs that have a great amount of power and influence, and it, it really matters. I mean, they determine the budget. You know, they can double the Norfolk Public School budget next year if they wanted to, if that is where their values fell. So there's, there's only so much influence anyone else has. Is it nice in a way, though, that you can jump in sort of with a cause you want to champion personally and then sort of get back out of the pool for things that maybe... To say, like, let's say you had won, you'd sort of be on, on the books for, and your voting record would be for all of the different things. Whereas having lost, you can sort of jump in with your project, you know, see that through, and then kind of get out. Yeah. Would and, you rather? Would you? And I, I, I appreciate your optimism and your, and your, well, listen, your, I your silver linings. But um, no. Um, the only good thing about me not winning is that I'm a much better person now than I was then. I, I think I'm, I'm more balanced. I think I'm, I'm more patient. I think I'm much more self-aware. So, if I ever do run again and and win, I will be a much better representative and, and leader than I would have been then. So the seasoning is, has done me well, but um, no, I, I, could, I would have done a lot of good as a city council member the last um, three years. I drove through the arts district on my way uh, over here and I saw, you know how when you set in your apartment, in your house, and you have your, your kitchen table, your dining room table, and you set a nice sort of basket of fresh fruit, and it just sort of makes the room a little nicer. Uh -huh. I feel like it's kind of like that. So when I drove through, I saw these kids with their mom, these two little girls, walking underneath or in front of the, uh, the, the fangs, the vampire teeth, and just sort of looked up with wonder at it. And then I, I turned the corner and uh, drove down in front of Alchemy, and there was a, like an organized group of children like sketching on the sidewalks. Uh -huh. But just having... Um, some color and a destination for for something just makes it something that it would never was because it was just a fucking depressing <laughs> place, man, for so long. Norfolk has a lot of positive and wonderful attributes, but taste is not among them. I mean, to some degree, it's it's a city that taste forgot. And there's reasons for that. And, you know, there's more important things than than being stylish and vibrant and um, consciously trying to visually inspire people. But we have a lot of strip malls. You know, we have a lot of, of malls and billboards, and it's a place much more driven by the bottom line and by commerce than um, really consciously being aware of what makes people happy. What do you think people talked about in city planning meetings from 1985 to 2000 in Norfolk? <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on all levels of government to have growth, quote unquote growth. And I, I think we get really obsessed with increasing the tax base, increasing population levels, um, 
you know, and I, th I think things like um, the Hotel Conference Center and we have these outlet malls they're planning. Um, and, you know, the, the, the city has this thing called city sites where they try to have economic development on every unused parcel. I think there's just so much pressure as the mayor or as a city council person to be able to go in front of the public and say, we did this, this and this. So I think often it's, quote unquote, growth for the sake of growth, even if it is not actually improving citizen quality of life or best land use. Do citizens care about a uh, city's financial bottom line? I mean, where would they get that? I feel like they're projecting their own idea onto the citizens if they feel like citizens care about the, uh, the financial bottom line of a city. And I think it, a lot of that comes down to the echo chambers that they end up in. I, I overuse this word consciousness, but I'm going to use it again, that we all have limited consciousness. There's only so many things that we can be thinking about or aware of at any given time. Um, and so if you go to your country club, if you um, go to your church that has your same class of people, if you live in Larchmont, which is where um, most of our leaders live and, you know, sort of the wealthy west side, then you end up in these echo chambers where things like development deals and real estate deals are, are what people talk about and, and what matters to them. So I think you get a really skewed view of what, what matters. You know, the average person in Norfolk um, is more likely to ride the bus. The average person on city council is more, it will never ride the bus, but they might ride light rail. So that's why we have what is really, when you get down to it, a classist and racist kind of um, mass transit vision where we're totally ignoring what actually gets people around the city, which are our buses and, and then bikes and then walking and going to this toy that, that the upper classes would feel comfortable on. I think Norfolk, from a leadership perspective, has wanted to, I don't know, it, it, it wants to have like more respect. It wants a different rep. It wants to hit like a next level as a city. And I think there's ways to do that are, that are real. You know, you have more parks, you're more bikeable, you have public art, you're really supporting those small, unique local businesses that give a place its character. Or you can cheat your way there. You can have a light rail, you can have a hotel conference center, you can have a cruise terminal, and then be able to say we're a legit mid-tier city. Um, but I think it's all the op complete opposite methodology you should be using to grow a city. seems almost apparent with the way that the, the light rail is that it's not just like you were saying, it, it's not, it doesn't seem to be intended to actually as a transportation means, because if, if it was a legitimate transportation means, then it would fucking go somewhere <laughs> and, or, and there would be stations where people live, or the majority of people uh -huh. live. And then why the whole thing even got off the ground. I mean, how hard is it to see, well, okay, we could have it, but it's not, it doesn't go anywhere. No, so it, it was, it was a total ego play. Um, by the city leaders at that time. You know, we don't have the concentration density in those places that really calls for light rail. You know, most people to, to use it, even if it was extended to the ocean front, you'd still have to drive to it. And then you get to the ocean front and it's total garbage when you get there. You know, you have to, you can't, you know, be right by the Neptune statue. Like it's crazy town. Right. Um, so then you have to drive again or get on a different transport. We it's just, actually Beach Town, USA. But <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. So we just don't, we're not set up for it. It, would, it was just a total ego play. And, and that's kind of hard to say as the, a bleeding progressive like I am that really believes in mass transit. The good news, I suppose, is that the, the ground was broken. Uh, there is a light rail with trains. And so in a way, it only can do more. I don't know. I, I feel like we're, we've backed ourselves into a corner, painted ourselves into a corner that there's no way out of because either you, you, you stop that project and you start spending that money in more intelligent ways that benefit more people like bus rapid transit and um, bike lanes and those kind of things that really move the average Norfolk citizen around. Or you keep throwing money at something that will only move so many people even at peak capacity. So, I mean, that's one project I'm kind of glad where I'm not on city council because my rational mind says you just, you let that be a loss. You let that be a weird, shiny little loss and then focus that limited transit funds on, on places where it's really needed. But then, but then you can't say that. Right. You can't be a Norfolk leader and say light rail was a failure. It, it's not a tenable position at, at this point.
In reference to the Arts District, but to other projects as well, what's something that people don't realize when it comes to making changes to a city? I mean, because you've been in the, you've been in, you're in the meetings. I mean, it, it, it sounds really trite, but the relationships are so important and listening is so important. And um, the relationships are, are more important than being right. You know, being the arts district wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a, an extended phase of relationship building, of going to the property owners, going to the stakeholders and explaining things to them, getting their input, letting them ask questions and letting them know that they are a part of it. And it's not sort of a top down thing that is being forced upon them. So people can easily make a difference in Norfolk. Norfolk is ripe for making a difference, but you have to have patience and you have to be willing to build relationships. You know, only like 10,000 people voted in my election. You know, and how many people show up to city council meetings or to the public hearings? You can really have a strong voice tomorrow if you have a little bit of charm and do a little bit of research. Specifically for the Arts District, what were some of the hurdles that you had to conquer? There actually, the biggest hurdle was time. You know, and Hannah and I were lucky at that time to not have kids to just be nuts, you know, to just be willing to really throw ourselves into something. But once we put together this vision document that really laid out where things could go, best practices from other cities, um, potential organizational structures, it was really easy for people to see the vision and to get on board and, and, and to want it to happen. But then it was just putting in the reps of all the lunches, all the presentations to different boards and all the emails and, uh, and all the questions and what will people see when they go? To the Neon Festival? Yeah. Um, they'll see a lot of public art. They'll see a lot of street performance and hopefully a lot of happy people. After the festival, how long are the murals going to stay? I mean, is this a, a one-year thing, a five-year thing, a 50-year thing? Is that still up in the air? We'll see. I mean, there are walls and, and buildings in this city that have been left to rot for decades. You know, that whale mural downtown has been there for what 20 years mm -hmm. 25 years yeah. so um there's no telling and and we'll see how things evolve uh one thing that i that i thought of when i was driving past the arts district was how the greyhound station is sort of the gateway depending on which way you're coming from uh to it and i from what i've read about you uh, the greyhound bus is, has sort of been the beginning and the end for quite a few things in your life did you did you think about that at all at any time while you were working on that street? Yes, and I had my heart broken last week when a project fell through. Um, Walt Taylor, who's a wonderful cartoonist for the Virginian Pilot, mm -hmm. um, did an illustrated map of Norfolk that was gonna go right in front of the Greyhound station so that when you got out, uh, walked off the bus, you had some sort of sense of place and sense of bearings, but that project fell through because of funding, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just class awareness. Not everyone flies here. You know, a lot of people show up on a Greyhound, and those people matter. And um, the way they experience this place really matters. And so it really is, I find it greatly gratifying that all the people who are going to show up on a Greyhound from here forward are going to feel like they've landed in a city that, that is vibrant and that welcomes them. Well, and there are few places on earth that can be as depressing as a Greyhound bus station. <laughs> and like I said, with the thing about the fruit or having just stepping out and seeing something beautiful or with color or original can just, I don't know, make you stand up a little bit straighter and put a smile on your face and and, you know, I don't know, call your mom or something, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, you know what I mean? That's the way I, um, because I do have a certain amount of guilt of putting so much time into public art and the way that I sell it to myself and, and kind of justify it is that art spreads compassion unlike anything else. And that's what we need more than any, that, that's what we need is people thinking about other people's feelings, people, um, you know, living their heart more than living for their wallet. You know, we're, we're such a, a, we're an oppressively um, consumerist society and a, an oppressively individualistic society. And the more we are thinking about ourselves as part of a greater human unit and a greater um, biological unit a, as a planet, the more we're all going to be happy, healthy, and sustainable. In part two of my interview with Jesse, we talk about growing up, 
his family, his travels, his many jobs, relationships, and more. Part two of my interview with Jesse Skacia will be released later in October. This is Andrew Paul Cronin, and you've been listening to the Q&A with APC. To hear archived episodes, go to soundcloud.com slash QAAPC, or subscribe to the show on iTunes. For exclusive content, including upcoming shows, behind-the-scenes pictures, and more, follow the show on Instagram at instagram.com slash QAAPC. The executive producer of the Q&A with APC is Ben Rilly.